Well, first I'll say Jai Baba. Baba. The next thing I'd like to say, it's been a very great privilege for me to be here because already I feel so much that is important. The intensity of um, the concern and focus on Baba here. So uh, I, I really do bring back from an occasion like this something that's the most worthwhile to me. Your Sahavas was uh, for such a large group of people and for so many things that you had to attend to. You people have really done a magnificent job. And I certainly applaud you for it. The, um, speaking about Meher Baba House, Adele, Adele brought that subject up. I had um, done the work to draw up the charter, uh, the bylaws, and then I had, I had to go to uh, my law school, which was not too far away in Williamsburg, Virginia, to talk with a, a tax professor there who was an expert because I wanted to make sure that the tax-exempt status would be uh, easily obtained by having it correctly prepared. And then when everything was finished, I sent it to um, someone in New York, someone in Long Island, who was an accountant and a lawyer. I don't remember his name. Anyway, it was the individual, I was dealing with someone up there, and he was a Baba person, he was an accountant and a, and a lawyer. And I felt, yes, I felt so proud of that because primarily, not of the technical part of it, I felt so proud of the charter. And, and because I spelled out who Mayor Baba was and what this organization was in re reference to God being on earth in human form. And I pictured in my mind the people that had to do with the approval of corporate charters for the state of New York. And, uh, and I, I got a lot of enjoyment out of that. So finally, when I went to New York, I was to go to Meher Baba House, and um, uh, to my surprise, let's see, I think I uh, read the charter out because I wanted to hear those wonderful words again. That, to me, was my inspiration from Baba to put down what this corporation was for. And then I found out it had not been incorporated. So what happened? The whole file was dumped back in my lap. And I didn't know what was wrong. I was told that um, the county court of New York County had been approached. And anyway, all of the information that was given to me, I could not fathom what in heaven's name was wrong that prevented this incorporation by the state of New York. So I came back and I went through it and I had looked up the corporate, uh, the, uh, the statutory law in New York at the law library at my school and I kept feeling in, inside that Baba wanted this thing completed. And so as time went on, something that you don't know exactly what you need to do, you tend to postpone. So I was postponing it, but I felt that pressure built, building up, and it got to the point where, and I, I uh, it got to the point where I knew I had to do something. So one day, late in the afternoon, I, I called uh, Albany, New York, to find out what was wrong with this charter, and the correspondence that the individual in New York gave me, resulting from his efforts to have the incorporation completed, uh, were a number of letters from different lawyers who worked for the corporation division, the Department of State, I think, in Albany. They handled the incorporation. So the first person I would ask for, he no longer works for the state of New York. Second person I asked for, on vacation. Third person I asked for, I don't know what the reply was. He wasn't available anyway. 
So I said, is there anyone there that I can talk with that is an expert on incorporating nonprofit, charitable, religious corporations? She said, yes, let me let you speak to Steve Relier. By this time, because the charter had not been accepted, because I had gone through the trouble of making sure everything was done as far as I could understand with somebody checking it over accurately, I was convinced the state of New York was run by the mafia. <laughs> And, I, and, that, and I was, that feeling, that reaction was precipitated in part by virtue of the enormous pressure I was feeling inside that Baba wanted this completed. So she said, let me let you speak to Steve Relier. So I, while I was speaking with him, I did, didn't know who he was, didn't know how to approach him, didn't know precisely what it was that was my problem. So, whatever it was I talked with him about, and we, we discussed it back and forth, and we, really not, we were not really uh, communicating in terms of anything explicit that needed to be addressed, needed to be addressed in that charter. So I said, look, uh, Mr. Relier, I said, in Virginia, if I have any problem with a corporation when I was practicing law, if I had any problems, I would just send the charter up to the State Corporation Commission in the, at the Capitol in Richmond, Virginia, and they would just say, do this and do this. He said, hey, it's a good idea. <laughs> and I said, you know, I did go to my law school up at William & Mary to get this thing uh, done as accurately as possible. He said, oh, did you go to William & Mary? I went to William & Mary. So little by little, I said, well, listen, Steve. <laughs> so as it turned out, I sent it, he said, send it on up to me. So I sent it on up to him, came back, and I think there were three changes. He said, uh, instead of saying, in the, and this is just vague in my recollection, instead of saying pursuant to the Corporation of the State of New York or whatever, he said, say pursuant to Section 194. And he said, instead of saying, I, I didn't like to say the principal house of worship, I put principal place of business of the corporate center. He said, put down principal place of worship so you wouldn't have any problems getting tax exempt, you know. He said, put your name and address on the blue back. I said, that's all? He said, that's all. So we did get it incorporated. The more important, uh, these are the little asides that all of us bump into every now and then when we're trying to do things that we think we must do in connection with our uh, work with Baba. The uh, main part, the main part was that uh, when Hoffman came, Bruce Hoffman came to my house, we wanted to make Baba's words, let your life itself be my message of love and truth, the cornerstone of that corporation. So basically, the, the democratic attitude that uh, Adele spoke of, and that was so close to Phyllis Frederick's heart, was uppermost in our mind. We had so many examples of uh, elitism in so many different kinds of institutions connected with very exalted uh, uh, projects and goals. And we didn't want that because that was not anything, I mean, that was the very thing that would deny, let your life itself be my message of love and truth. And also, when Baba was in the physical body, there was this group and that group and the other group, and Adele will bear this out, no one paid that much attention to uh, people who had been a long time with Bob or not a long time with Bob or this person had certain priorities ostensibly. Uh, these things were not really important. Uh, they, sometimes they squabbled like children and of course Bob would straighten it out just like that. Bob was such a towering figure uh, that uh, uh, there was no importance to this corporation or that corporation. Uh, during the... Uh, uh, so that's... So that... Um, was one of the very important concerns that we had and we tried to translate that into this document, into this, ins into this corporate charter and of course with Baba this corporate business is simply a question of efficiency, that's all. The real work is always the same. If we ultimately end up, uh, if the, um, what was that group you people have now? Uh, the permanent site group? <laughs> I guess the permanent site with Baba is the heart. <laughs> and you're going to project out somewhere into illusion and uh, build something. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, Bob owes me a couple of favors, so I, I'm going to ask him to, uh, if that's really close to your heart about this permanent site, well, gee whiz, Baba, I'll cash in one of my favors. <laughs> <laughs> we're, all, we're all totally bankrupt when it comes to being indebted to Baba. <laughs> anyway, we always bear in mind that as time goes on and more and more people come to Baba, it's, it's even much more important that we remember what we're doing. And the reason for our existence is to totally focus on Baba, to make his message of love and truth our message to others, to make our lives uh, reflect our devotion to the pristine, pure meaning that uh, God in human form always is. The, the privilege that we have is enormous. And it, I wish sometimes that I had the mind of 15 Einsteins so that I could keep in the front of my mind and see more clearly in every little detail and capture every subtle nuance of that incredible privilege. That, you know, when, when Baba says the truth displaces nothing, that is, you, we see these other people who uh, say put forth some kind of credential about uh, being authorized to speak for God. And here is God himself, the truth, and he displaces nothing. That's why you have to be the one to find him. You have to be the one to find him in the sense you have to leave illusion enough. You have to leave the playthings of the world enough. And then he finds you so that when he comes, he's not going to hold up the evidence of his enormous divinity. Up, oh, enormous divinity. Is that, is that, a, is that a redundancy? <laughs> enormous divinity. <laughs> He's not, going to, he's not going to give that demonstration of his infinite power in my way of looking at it. He could certainly easily do that. You, we all hear little bits and pieces and it's happened to each one of us. In some instances it's more graphic in that uh, what, has, what, the, what is related to you sort of makes you realize specifically, ah, this infinite power of Baba, he's, he's just completely nullified all the laws of the gross world in this instance. Well, he's not going to do that. I tried to get him to do that. He won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> he's not going to do that because then you're going to bow down to his power. And we, don't we see people bowing down to other ordinary human beings' power every moment of the day? They bow down, in figuratively speaking, they bow down to this person and that person for so many reasons having to do with I think I can get something out of that person in the material sense. And Bob is not going to do that because what is necessary is to awaken love in the heart. That's the only thing that changes us. And that's not going to happen except through obedience. And the obedience is an absolute blessing because of what it results in. It results in the awakening of love. Once the love is awakened, it's all downhill. You want just like we know what we know about infatuations. We can't, uh, again, Majnun, Layla. We can't get that beloved out of the head, out of the heart, out of the emotions. But really, you know, we're attracted to Baba because we have left illusion sufficiently so that, the, so that the more quiet conscience, which is God in us, Baba said, one day <clears throat> you will find I have always been your own higher self. We have been searching for, for our own higher self from the beginning of time, from the beginning of our journey in illusion. So that when we have come to the place where Baba has given the gift of conviction to us, then what has happened is that when we pay the slightest amount of attention to God in the human form, 
we, such, we see such magnificence as Baba's own words describe for posterity. So what it is, we are attracted to him that much, and the more we put our minds on, our thoughts on him, the more we will be preoccupied with those qualities. And the reason we're drawn so powerfully to the extent we put our minds there to him is that is because that is exactly what we are and we have been looking for for endless time but only when as Bao has puts has used has given us in so many different ways only when the time is right does Baba explain or do something when it will fructify when it will bear fruit with all of us he has given us the conviction because it will bear fruit. We will come directly to God through the God-man. We will do that. And as I remarked over and over again, and everything bears repeating, his wish is that we eliminate the suffering. Get rid of it. It's unnecessary. You cannot do it except through obedience. Obedience simply means putting Baba First, each one will find the way when they try to do the obedience by putting him first before those small thoughts. Then those thoughts become channeled through Baba's love. So when you develop the habit of thinking of Baba, then there is the inevitable likelihood that you will put him first. That is to say, the smallness of the thoughts will be something you'll want to shove aside. And when I say small, putting Baba first applies, it, it's not, what, in 31 I think it was, Baba goes to Hollywood and he's royally feted by the moguls of the, of the motion picture industry. He's royally feted and Baba points out what an enormously uplifting influence the motion picture can have. To have that uh, visual dramatization of such uh, uh, cannot help but capture the attention of the audience and and when he says what is he talking about he's talking about dramatizations that involve the demonstration of great human character and then Baba very charmingly says and these films do not have to be about religious themes isn't that charming because character is religious, is spiritual, not religious. So, so Baba pointed out that that is the means of focusing the individual's mind. And when they depict great character in a particular well-done dramatization, you are deeply moved for a time. Our work is to not wait to go to a film since we're very special in the sense that we've come this distance and have received that gift our work is to try not to allow any moment to go by without either remembering Baba or remembering that you didn't remember Baba which amounts to re making a renewed effort <laughs> I mean that's our work it's done silently it's done quietly the external evidence of it is the quality that n gradually, gradually becomes visible in your most ordinary actions and in your most uh, important actions. And the source of that then becomes your conviction about Baba rather than your ego which wants to impress someone. That kind of quality gives you the kind of inner enrichment which results in gradually increasing freedom. With increasing freedom, one of the noticeable effects is that you enjoy almost everything. I don't want to mislead you and give you the impression that simply because I had what I consider to be a very difficult life, well, it's the only one I left, lived, I don't know how to compare it with somebody else's except by drawing certain inferences, but what I want to say is I can tell you uh, that certainly it was worth that to find out this, to find this, 
Well, Baba referred to it to me as the miracle that uh, I was looking for. And, but then he said, I want you now to forget all the things that were maybe not so pleasant in your life. Because you've now found the miracle. And that, of course, applies to every one of us. It applies to everything and everyone in creation. Baba is most practical. Putting Baba first does result in putting your head in the clouds, but your feet on the ground. Both are necessary because it results, <clears throat> it results in an increasingly worthwhile conscious existence for each person. Whereas we look to other things in illusion for a worthwhile conscious existence and we're, we're disillusioned one time after another. With Baba, it doesn't work that way. If we begin to focus on him by putting him first, then the fruit of that effort is experienced. It's a great, great thing to hear stories from individuals who've made an effort to put Baba first and their inner life becomes increasingly transformed so that it's no longer important for the wrong reasons that I have this job or that job or I own this or I own, don't own that or I go here or there or I know this one or that one or I'm alone or in a crowd I was saying I have, I, I'm with people all day long so that I really love being alone because I'm, a, I'm not alone uh, I, to me Baba is an incredible mystery and, I, and, I, and I, I, I don't sleep well at night and so because of that I have um, the only thing I can either read novels and I began to uh, mysteries which I do like to read because they're very fast paced and they're very um, they're um, they easily amuse you but I, I began to realize I'm really wasting time I just still read them but I now I want to I want to get over the hump so to speak and thinking about Baba because getting over the hump is simply only this getting over the hump by making yourself think about Baba is simply taking your mind on something that very easily amuses you and that little transition removing your thoughts from that or your consciousness from that and putting it on Baba seems like it's a little burden requires a little effort but that's all then after I did it for a while I began to feel this was so mysterious this incredible reality God that we all came to know so well is around everywhere in my room I mean he's everything consciously right there find him Henry find him find him find him he's closer than your own breath find him I said my god this thought intrigues me so I play around with it then pretty soon I go to sleep <laughs> but it is a mystery and I really see I literally see Baba's eyes light up Yes, Henry, that is the mystery I want you to unravel. I am the greatest mystery. I am closer than your own breath. I am, and that's what makes other people tolerable. My God, <laughs> this, the same incredible reality that's in me is in them, even in him. <laughs> well, barely in him. <laughs> And really, it, makes, it kind of makes you lighthearted. It kind of makes you lighthearted about life. But don't, those, those um, feelings of closeness with Baba, we all have heard this business of the pendulum. Baba pushes me away so I can come back so that you can come return to him closer and on and on and on. Forget it, Baba, we're changing the rules. We're not going to let you put a, push us away so much. We're going to enjoy that arid spot between the two oases when you're, we feel you're here and we're going to trek out in that desert and say, ha! We know you're still here, even though it's a desert. <laughs> See? I think Baba would be very pleased with that kind of an attitude. That's what he wants. He wants any way to put him first. Because the desert's not really a desert. What is real? Infinite bliss. That's, that's what reality is. So laugh at the illusion. But you can't laugh at the illusion until you focus on Baba. Because he's the antidote. He's the catalyst. We all, we all are quite aware of what we think are our limitations or the extent that we have anything noble 
in the, in the quality of our conscious existence. But it's all wrong. When someone says to me, Baba sees me as God, I said, I don't even know what it means. How can he see me as God? You know, look in the mirror. I know what I'm thinking. I know what I've done. I know what I want. I know what I think of him. How can he think, how can he see God in me? Well, suppose you go into a cave that's a uh, hundred miles below the surface of the earth. And let's say that the earth has been here for seven and a quarter billion years. And in that black pit, at such a deep place in the earth, that has been black for seven and a quarter billion years, you strike a match, and seven and a quarter billion years of blackness is wiped out instantly. Very satisfied with the small little gifts from Baba, which result from my focusing on him. It makes me able to go to my job and do it and not feel so heavy. Or it makes me go to a, this group or that gathering or whatever it may be and, not, and, and feel that the real possibility of being lighthearted while you're doing anything is because of Baba. That is sufficient. However, the purpose of life is as he states it is. It's to find that he has always been our own higher self. The reason we can't be satisfied is because we've always been looking for that self. We've always been looking, well, we admire a great quality in another human being. We want to go to that human being. We want to be around that human being. My God, this guy's strong. He's unselfish. He's handsome. Well, we can leave that one out. <laughs> He has the real handsomeness. She has the real beauty. And if you have any, um, if you have any exposure to that in an ordinary gross conscious human being, you're enormously drawn to that. Again, because you won't settle for anything less than that. But that we have to keep in the front of our minds, and that is what our work with Baba is. Our work with Baba is to eliminate ignorance in the only way that it can be eliminated through obedience, because. The reason obedience is greater than love is because you cannot have the kind of love Baba is talking about except through obedience. I've noticed myself that <clears throat> those times when I feel as though I have put Baba first and consequently have been obeying him, I really, I really want to think about him more. And when I am not putting him first, it's a burden to think about him because I know I have not put him first and I know very well within myself nobody has to judge me I'm not taking an exam I know what I've lost I know what my willfulness has resulted in I'm familiar with my ignorance and so consequently the burden is that I know I've wasted time I've relaxed my grip on his dominant to some extent the grip on dominant is a second to second thing simply because Bob is not there standing admonishing you when you did wrong. Unless you focus on him, then you feel it. The beautiful thing is that his presence, his presence in a very delightful way, it can be profound, yes, but you know how Baba's humor, how magnificent his humor was and is. I never think of Bob in the past, I think of him in the present. I've been much closer to Bob in the present than in the past. So it's only when uh, the occasion arises when people want to know something about any physical association with Baba that, uh, that you might think of these things. And I have tried hard to remember Baba in the way I've seen him. I'm not very successful all the time at that. I'm more successful at feeling the mysteriousness that Baba is, the, his, his, the, the thought that he's totally present, totally conscious with me all the time and with you all the time. I, I, it, it, it alleviates the, the heaviness of anything that happens in the physical world to know that it's not real. But I need to know that more and more. And so consequently, I think everyone else needs to know that more and more. Everyone else needs to be lighthearted and free inside. And there's only, way that it ha only one way that it happens. So that's what Baba is really all about. The great thing is that every single moment can be transformed by our own effort without going anywhere. 
We go to places like this, or to the center, or to Myrtle Beach, or to Avatar's abode, or wherever, because we become re-inspired, we become refocused. But bear in mind that if you don't take Baba with you, you don't have him. Now it's true you come here, you can come here without being consciously aware that Baba is with you, and you can, you can have the experiences here that gradually cause you to push yourself aside. Well, not pushing yourself aside causes you to experience, what is it? The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. You're very vulnerable. A glance from an individual can upset you. But if you think you're focused on Baba, you don't notice those glances or you don't notice as much those things that normally would be a threat to your emotional security. So the, the, the greatest psychology therapy that has existed since the beginning of creation has been to do that work which makes it possible for each one of us to focus on the only one that can hold our attention to the point that it absorbs us completely and that is God in human form. Anything else will hold your attention for a time because it titillates the mind to some extent. It seems to be a shortcut to character, to discipline, to experiencing inter internal freedom. But that's all. Those experiences all of us have had endlessly. The God-man, that's why None come unto the Father except through me. The manifestation of God in the human form is the only one that can hold your attention and increase the focus of your attention and make it impossible for you not to resist wanting to focus on that reality. That's why it takes God to counteract the enormity of illusion in human form. But it is a mistake even to, to think that because I am convinced he is God, I don't really have to put him first, so I don't have to do that work. That's a big mistake. That mistake lasts for a time. My personal opinion is that the amount of time it takes to really uh, experience the greatest thing in creation, something more of your own reality, is something... The free will to accomplish this rests in our own hands. That's my own personal feeling, and this is how I understand Baba. If Baba tells me to make an effort to put him first, and he tells you that, well then it's logical that we know we're not making an effort lots of times. It's also logical to assume that if God, who knows everything, tells you to do that, and that's the most important thing that you can do because it will result in obedience, then you must know that something very worthwhile, if creation came into existence so that you could experience your godhood through the development of consciousness, then you must know that the God-man tells you those things that you can do. He doesn't ask us to go to the widest to place in your bay in San Francisco or somewhere and build a bridge with your own two hands. He has not asked you to do that. If he were to ask you to do that and he was God, you'd have no, no, no other alternative except to try to do that. But he doesn't ask you to do that. He says, simply put me first. He says, he has only required that we try to be decent in the real sense, not in the artificial sense. Not in the appearance sense, appearance sense. Not in the sense that we're trying to impress someone. You will always impress someone if you put him first, I can assure you. We all have had limited experiences of that. Because when you put him first, you're more sincere. Sincerity is the only thing that ever has communicated. You could write volumes in a book and it could all sound very, 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 very uh, knowledgeable, intelligent, and it can be empty. It can be as worthless as those cans rolling downhill. Real quality is the difference in our lives 
by putting him first, is the difference between an exquisitely contrived and made baby doll and a live baby. It's the difference between looking at the most magnificent gourmet meal in a color photograph of gourmet magazine and sitting at the table about to partake of one. There isn't any comparison. What we admire in another, Baba requires that we experience within ourselves through focusing on him by putting him first. He wants the quality of our lives from moment to moment to constantly continue to improve just as there is a noticeable ascent of the sun which gradually eliminates blackness, gradually illumines, brings color and life to that which is illumined. So with our own consciousness. Consciousness lost in the byways of thinking, the mind, is not constructive. It's constructed if Baba's there first. Then your thoughts. Baba, putting Baba first or thinking about Baba is like a great light. And you can really see the quality of those thoughts normally. And your normal tendency would be to push them away, to increase the quality of those thoughts. That's why it's necessary. The Dhamman is to me a very short expanse of leeway from the oak, the mighty oak of Baba's tree so that I don't go wandering out of that garden. The garden is where my work is, to put him first. I may have many different kinds of things there, but I'm always tied to that tree. So I don't get lost and forget the tree, forget the garden, and get lost in illusion. There's so many things happening out there. I thought of that in, in, in uh, Los Angeles. There's so many people, you go on the freeway or any place that you go, you see all these people. All of them have their heads filled with thoughts. The, the head filled with thoughts is okay if you're conscious of the common denominator. See, the common denominator is purpose. The common denominator dictates how you will do what you're going to do. What you will think when you're driving to Los Angeles. What will be your response when somebody annoys you out on the highway? That common denominator is the quality. That is the, that is the focus on Baba. That is putting Baba first. It doesn't take very long to begin to experience his presence that way. And look what you have then. Look what you have. His presence is always there. We are not there, except occasionally. We can be there. This is how I understand Baba. You can be with me constantly. Well, between being with him constantly, which is to merge with him, there are so many little oases where you're going to be with him more and more and more. Think of that. Heaven literally must be on earth. Heaven must be wherever it is we are. Baba paid no attention to death. Going from one room to another, breaking a string. One necessary experience is here, difficult, yes. The next experience is there, restful, but necessary, yes. Both contiguous, the same. Different purposes are served. What is the purpose? Get rid of ignorance by putting him first. If you do it all day tomorrow, if you have a five-day plan, give yourself some five-day plans, one-day plan. I'm going to really make an effort to put him first. What that means in terms of what is graspable to our intellect is, is, is simple. As again, we all know what a, a fine human being is. And, that's, and we admire it because that's what we are. But why should we go over there to him? I'm not saying we should not go over there to him. That's always a nice attraction or her. But stop postponing becoming that fine human being because you got the greatest help in creation. Personal God. The greatest help in creation. The only help in creation. Our journey now, now that we believe in the real God, is direct. It's no more a secure thing. 
What is circuitous is when we don't put Baba first. When we don't put Baba first, we're going with Baba still pulling us direct, but we're not enjoying the trip. That's terrible. We are in a nightmare of thinking. Instead of putting Baba first, we says, ah, I'm here to see him in, with increasing clearness so that what I do not see with my eyes becomes more visible than that which I do see with my eyes. Well, conviction makes you know that what you cannot see with your eyes is more real than what you do see with your eyes. We know that physicists say that if you break matter down to the, its finest point, it disappears. It becomes consciousness, the most advanced physicists. So this is nothing. But it as sure is a heavy nothing. <laughs> 50,000 Frenchmen may be wrong, but they're also very heavy. <laughs> so we really do need, we really do need to be propped up. First externally, by God, our conviction makes it possible to build that bridge. The bridge is simply thinking about him as much as possible. When that does happen, Baba is always wanting to pour his love on us. His love is in, results in increased awareness. Increased, increased awareness is incompatible with fast, feverish thinking. You remember that statement, God racing, I mean mind racing is mad. Mind slowed down is saint, mind when working normal is man, mind stopped is God. Increased awareness is incompatible with a racing mind. You can be doing nothing and if your mind is quiet, you feel a richness inside. And again and again and again I repeat, a quiet mind is a powerful tool, Baba is the key. To a quiet mind. You only get through techniques that exclude that which can hold your attention with increasing tenacity, God-man. You only get a semblance of quietness of mind when any other key is used. And by that I simply mean that as soon as a little pressure is applied, your mind will become feverish again. Worry will be there again. With Baba, increasing work makes you look big problems right in the face and they gradually retain their normal size and dimension. A fast, feverish mind makes any problem loom up to gigantic proportions. When your mind, we do, it is useful to have some techniques. Something I learned from Baba, don't ask me how or why, but you try it first, and if it works, then say, all truth is Baba. But if you are upset, or if something is bothering you, do something physical that's constructive. Do something physical. Use your will to do something you don't want to do that's physical. It doesn't require too much thinking. That is therapeutic. The effect of it is, it simply causes the froth of the mind to come settling down a bit. And the dimensions of the problem goes back into its normal size. That's all. But you see, the, the first thing you start off with is this. Baba himself said, isn't it wonderful? I never leave you. Isn't it wonderful? I never leave you. I am closer to you than your own breath. I am not this body. You all have been children in my love. You must go home and find me where I really exist in the heart of my lover. See, he said over and over and over again, those things way back there in time. These things gradually become increasingly meaningful to each one of us and we find out that Baba is present. We have little experiences. We want to find a way to make that happen. Now, in terms of, in terms of my own experience, there were times... Oh, let me give you this example, this story. There's something that happened to me. 
Well, you know, I wrote, I wrote quite a bit to Baba, and I've got some very beautiful letters, well, you know. And uh, I was always trying to express, uh, I was always trying to find the words worthy to say to God. So it was really, it was my effort at praise. And the, and the difficulty was that I really did need to be an exquisite, eloquent poet. Because that is what should be said to God. But I was not a poet, you see, so I did, had to do the best I could. Okay. And a few times, uh, out of the blue, here comes a cable. Your love makes me, I love, you know, that sort of thing. So, and, and sometimes uh, it, it happened when I was very depressed. And just comes. Well, so in 58, when we went down to the center at Myrtle Beach, you know, Baba was the most important fact of my existence. As whatever capacity I had to do something about that, notwithstanding. No matter how preoccupied my mind might have been on and off with worthless things, nevertheless, it was never, there was never any doubt that he was the most important fact of my existence. So I get down to Myrtle Beach, and I think other than we all initially greet Baba or something like that, it seemed as though Baba sent for everyone except me. Come, this one comes, this one comes, into the lagoon camp, you know, back and forth. And I'm sitting there eating my heart out. I'm really eating my heart out. That was an absolutely um, severe and painful conflict for me to be experiencing. What was that one who was more important to me than anything or anyone wasn't paying any attention to me as though I didn't exist. So that kind of a conflict I just could not resolve. I wouldn't go and, uh, and I, my nature is not to find a false answer or a false escape. That's never been satisfying to me. So I had to face it and so consequently the difficulty was felt very intensely. And I had to resolve it truthfully. Well it took me it had to go from this point of intense feeling of pain because of the severity of this conflict that was right in front of my eyes. I was going to say in front of my nose, but that's too far away. It was in front of my eyes. <laughs> I had this conviction from the very beginning before I saw him, he was God in human form. All of a sudden, everything sprung into focus in life. Life had the highest possible meaning, which was accessible to me. I was on the royal road. And the source of all of this was not paying any attention to me. So that severity of that conflict kept there and the only way I could resolve it was the true way. I said, Baba is God, I'm just shortening, Baba is God in human form. He doesn't want to see me. God's will should be my will. If God doesn't want to see me, I don't want to see him. I got to his will. I really did get to surrender to his will and I can assure you people. But then I lost it. I lost the paper, but I, so I knew what it was like to surrender to his will. It was beautiful. Why was it beautiful? Because of that enormous need to resolve this horrible conflict, I had to accept the truth, which was whatever God's will is, is exactly what I ought to have. Well, you, I can't do that every moment, but that's, we will get to that point. And when we've, and when you surrender to Baba's will, it was such a magnificent feeling for me. It just burned itself in my mind. It burned itself in my mind. So that, uh, uh, that was in his presence, yes. But, with, with, but you see, surrendering to his will, I was in his presence and he was saying all these things and I was on cloud nine because I had surrendered to his will at a time when he didn't want to see me. I didn't care whether he ever wanted to see me again. That's what I experienced from surrendering to his will. It didn't make any difference so long as I was surrendering to his will, whether he saw me or not. Whether he said this is my first human incarnation or my last, didn't make any difference. None of those things, that's in the imagination. I hope, I hope. If Baba says something nice to you, what do you do? You say, God, I hope he's right. <laughs> you certainly don't feel it. He tells you you're a strong follower of his, a strong lover. And you feel weak. What is it? It's words. The work is still there to do. The work is to put him first. Every one of us, every one of us is divine. So the five minutes is up. 
And I, again, I ha it was a rare privilege for me to be with you magnificent people. You're magnificent because you all have conviction that God exists in the form of the Avatar. Avatar may hear Baba Kijay.